You're listening to Inside the Minds with Dante Marsh and Ryan Hyde. A podcast about life, lessons, and whatever the hell else they want to talk about. So Jesse, I saw you were on uh, Instagram earlier with a with some karaoke, and you're gonna, looking for for a lighter, looking to light some shit on fire. <laughs> well, I made a torch. I, I've always wanted one of those old fashioned like medieval torches. Like, like I want to go do something where we actually have torches and pitchforks in the street. I think that would just be a good look. So <laughs> I set about the task of trying to figure out how to make an actual torch. Nice. And did you succeed? Yeah, but it dripped a lot of fluid, and then it ran down the tube that I had it on, and I almost <laughs> lit myself on fire. So I guess lessons learned. Lessons learned. That is that's crazy. And I got my Eagles of Death Metal T-shirt on, and we'll talk about that. All right, you. You got to represent, man. You got to represent tonight on the Inside the Minds podcast. Our first music artist joins the show. Please welcome the lead singer of Eagles of Death Metal, Mister Fucking Jesse Hughes. Awesome. That was an awesome introduction, dude. That was, I love you for that. Thanks, Jesse. And of course- Better my, even than some of my own friends. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, my co-host, uh, Mr. Dante Marsh. How's it going, going, brother? No, good, good, good as always. Blessed and can't complain. Oh, Same Let's, for me, man. I, every day I'm still breathing is a beautiful day. 100%. So Jesse, what's been going on during the, uh, the COVID pandemic? Uh, during the house arrest or uh, uh, lockdown. Um, uh, um, well, I personally stayed free. So, you know, I, I, I followed the science and wrote a lot of music. I shot a video with my dear friend, Muck Sticky in, in Memphis, which was amazing. And I've, I've been roller skating every day. And uh, the karaoke, dude, that has changed me, man. You know, when you're bored or when you have to do something to fill your time and when you're fortunate enough to get to do something like we do, where it's uh, essentially something that we love and almost isn't really a job. Sometimes you have to fill your time and karaoke was what I did. And I've never considered myself a singer. And now I want to like in a year of singing karaoke, like, dude, I'm, I'm ready for American Idol, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and you're, you're on there like every night too, aren't you? Most nights. You know, in the weirdest way, I wouldn't have thought of it that this would be possible, but a community of, rock and rollers has developed around my Instagram broadcast that is an equal part of the uh, attraction to it. I'm fascinated by the fact and of the ability to have a personal sensation relationship via this medium. It should be impossible. So God works in mysterious ways. I, I, think, I think, I think this, the, <clears throat> the pandemic <clears throat> has created an opportunity for all of us to uh, delve into other parts of ourselves, like to get get out of the comfort zone and the and the try new things. And like you just alluded to, that these mediums, these social uh, media platforms, uh, via Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all the other things that are going on now, has allowed people to become more personal. Right. And it, it 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 has really opened up the floodgates for like me and Ryan created. He interviewed me for his first podcast, and then after that, we talked. And it was like, dude, let's do a podcast together. So you see how it works. Dude, it, that's, and, and what you said is, is what I really want to point out is the attitude of opportunity, looking at something as an opportunity there. I know it's hard sometimes, but God does make it so that everything is an opportunity. And it really isn't how you look at it. You know, I was in a terrorist attack six years ago and I could have walked away from it looking like it was the most horrible thing, but I saw people do incredible acts of love and heroism. So even when the bad guys were trying to make it this way, all I saw was the greatest acts of love and sacrifice I've ever seen. So the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. Right. They don't um, win. Attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Opportunity, dude. I, I already love being on this. This is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Jesse. You close that door for me, baby. If it's okay with you, Jesse, we'll talk about that night in Paris a little bit later on. Absolutely. I have, it's actually part of my therapy. I, I have no problem talking about it. Okay. So funny story. Um, 
so it was two years ago i saw you in victoria with one of my favorite bands uh the queens of the stone age so my girlfriend surprised me with tickets for the show so i'm ecstatic i'm like yes queens of the stone age and she's like you're not gonna believe who's opening for them i'm like fuck i don't know who's opening for them and she side note she very much dislikes the eagles of death metal i don't know why but when i put it on in the truck we're driving around she's like shut this shit off i'm like this is this is my happy music this is this is my time like i need this it has that effect on some folks right so anyways her very first concert that night was eagles of death metal so that you right so she sat, she sat through that show with me and uh and loved it and had a good time and you guys put on a kick-ass show and then uh we got uh, queens of the stone age on after that so it was a good time nice that's funny because i make music for girls but <laughs> but dudes that love our music they're romantics and they tend to be really i hate i love this about our uh, the people that love our music but dudes that love our music seem to get it and they they really love their girls like, I love it that so many couples come to our shows. I, I know that sounds corny, but I like successful relationships. <laughs> I, I, I think they're awesome, man. I mean, I, everything doesn't have to be, you know, dick swinging and, and, and fucking, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, Absolutely. Not everything. Absolutely. No, that you, I mean, but, but you know what? That comes with maturity, right? Right. Remember, Ryan, we was talking about this a while ago. Everything, like, for me, um, personally, I, I like, I'm like, I'm so proud of who I've become and who I'm becoming because I was not this person. <laughs> you know oh, what wow. I mean? Yeah. So with the maturation process happening and then, you know, life happening, getting married young and having kids and family and being afforded the, you know, um, ability to be blessed enough to play a professional sport for 12 years and coming from where I came from, the inner city of Oakland, California, I mean, got a bachelor's degree, a master's degree. I'm like, defied the odds, right? Absolutely, brother. I'm a statistic. So I just, I just feel like along your journey, when you, when you grow exponentially too, like you put away a lot of the childish bullshit that you, you, you were accustomed to. And then you find yourself disliking some of the shit you used to do. And then you start, right. I was telling Ryan, I was joking. I said, all the old man boring shit I thought was old man boring shit as a younger person, that those are my favorite things. Dude, man. it's awesome. <laughs> like like golfing, you know, I'm a cigar smoker. Uh, I'm not- you the play golf? I'm not great. I, I look damn oh, good. Oh, dude, I love you immediately. So I, I just got a new set of Callaways, baby. Hey. And so that's like, I like doing the old man boring shit because it's so, relaxing and calming like i love it i've learned that it's not so much that i i, I thought it was boring it's it's deliberate mm -hmm. the activities of our grandparents are very deliberate they're very spaced out because they're filling their time with beautiful space you know what i mean mm -hmm. that's where the wisdom came from i like the fact that that uh it, it it it's good for people to be able to talk about the the exponential shift of maturity that either will happen or or don't won't happen depending upon how willing you are mm -hmm. to receive it you know what i mean oh yeah I, and i see maybe a lot of that isn't happening in today's world sometimes i don't know well i i think society i mean a lot of a, a lot of things that would have been unacceptable a few maybe four decades ago is totally it's 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 great it's 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 welcomed and it's crazy because a lot of those things that were frowned upon that are, you know, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. More right. Than, right. It's anything goes now. And I think we, we, as a people, we need to get, you know, shift those things back to like the respect level from, from one generation to the next. Um, uh, dude, respect <laughs> and of true appreciation for what someone does yes. so that you see things in a proper context. So that we are as a people, not able to be emotionally moved in a group to a place or to a, a, a belief based on who we hate as opposed to who we like. These things are critical and, and it's these little details that will make the difference between free society and society that needs a nanny. Yeah, I agree. Because when you act like a child, my grandma used to say, you know, if it looks like an Indian, it smells like an ain't John Wayne, son. So don't pretend like <laughs> that's what it is. You know, like don't bullshit me, son. And, uh, but, 
it requires respect. Uh, free society only works if everyone follows the rules on their own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's my monster's clock. I forgot. I never thought that the monster's clock would be chiming right now. That's awesome. I've, I've heard that clock before. You know what? It's so funny that I've got you on because I just got a ton of uh, cards that I want to show you. I collect baseball cards and I just got a Johnny Unitas. Oh my goodness. Nice. Wow. And I got a Jim Brown in here somewhere. Jim Phillips from the Rams. Wow. And I got, I know I got a Dude, Willie Gallimore. I love Willie Gallimore. Nice. You got, you got some classic cards over there, sir. Frank Vericcioni. I love this dude. This is when there were Italian dudes in the football uh, leagues. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that should be a story. Dude, Ralph Guglielmi. I mean, dude, come on. That's oh. awesome. I love, I love the fact that this, that just looks so amazing to me. You and the stats on the back, I love how it's done, man. I mean. Yeah. You want to know what's funny? I always tell these young guys. I said, when I was growing up, because I'm 42, so 80s and 90s, there was no internet. I had a beeper in high school. Yeah, me phones. too. <laughs> so <laughs> what I did as a kid, there was no NFL network. So when football season was over with, it was just over for six months. Yep. But I, I used to collect cards and I would read the back and study them. Like to this day, some of my friends and teammates would be like, ask Marsh, he's like a walking encyclopedia for sports. Like, so I, that's how I learned the history of the game of guys that played before me was to read the back of the card. You know, you get the packs of card, got some gum in it and shit and you put it in a plastic thing and you just read and you learn. Right. And it's funny because the young people today, they don't, and that's what I was talking about respect. Like they don't care about, now we'll talk about the music form. Cause I get in this, I got a 19, uh, my son will be 19 on Sunday. So I, oh, awesome. I argue with his generation about the quality of rap music. Yeah, but 21 year old. Yeah, and just music in general. I'm like, this shit is trash, man. They not even, it's, 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 it has no, um, like the art form isn't there. It's like all they care about is being popular and trying to make money. Right, so, and, and that's all their lyrics show. Yes. Snoop Dogg has a really incredible like uh, uh, dialogue about the modern day rap and it's really insightful and he makes incredible points. You know, it's like the same, there's no art in it. No. It's no. merely a, a, a beep to uh, boast about what you have. Yeah. You know, like in the old days, like a uh, uh, member, uh, uh, I got a funky, funky rhyme, like, uh, bah, 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 bah. Yeah, the nice references and would be universal, yeah, dude. Nice and smooth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. That nice and smooth. Like, <laughs> those lyrics are so intelligent. And there's a, even the sampling has an element of art to it. Yes. You know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And AMG, even Bitch Better Have My Money, or EPMD, that shit is yes. amazing. Yes. Yeah. And, he takes more bounce. The, Eric Sermon takes more bounce, and then he it flips it. Flips it, and it's the same. Yet there's an art to it. Yes, because context is king, man. Yeah, every yeah. situation situational, and hip hop. Like my high school uh, talent show, I was Professor Griff, and we did uh, 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 "Don't Believe the Hype," and I graduated <laughs> in '90. But if there was an art. And there was a uni true universal appeal in a way that didn't require any uh, selling out in any way, shape, or form. Well, well, back then you also had to be good, and that's that's yeah. talking about the the music industry and the and the and the and the athletic industry as well. So you're talking about guys like, and I tell my son all the time, man, the best rappers aren't the most paid rappers. Like guys like Nas, it, I mean, he's big, but he put, he's he should be way bigger. But the way, his, the way his lyrical content is, is too, like for these kids now, it has to be cookie cutter. It's buh, 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 right. buh. It's like they're in there punching in. They're not even, they don't even come in there with like written material. They do things yeah. called playlists. They don't even sing a complete sentence. Yeah. It's every word <laughs> edited. Yeah. <laughs> which is insane. You know, you said something earlier that was a real relevant reference. You looked at the cards. Well, I looked at the albums, my dad's records. I wanted to see where it was recorded. And did, was there a difference? Did the place that it was recorded, did that affect the tone? And the person that produced it, was that like really effective? Just like, is there really a difference when a team is helmed by this coach as opposed to this or this man? Like when you get into it, you see it for what it is. And that's when you become an artist. My dad used to say there's a lot of magicians running around, but there's very few wizards. Yeah. Right. Yep. Analogy. 
And well, I, well, I, I, I've always <laughs> wanted to be a wizard. Well, I mean, I know all of us in the same, pretty much in that same era, right? So it was a, it was a fun thing to, to look at the inserts. I remember yeah. the Sugar Hill Gang album, the Isley Brothers, because my older brother and sister, they had records back then. You know, right. I, I had some records. So you would look, I could, I could remember one in particular, Isley Brothers album, and then you opened it up and it had all the Isley Brothers, Ronald, Chris, all of them, and they and they, you know, their Those glitter outfits. Yes, yes. Absolutely. And then they had their uh, astrological sign. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was dope. You went and actually bought cassette tapes and, and, and albums to part of the beauty of it with the, I, I used to look on the back of the tape side, like, okay, engineered by, produced Absolutely. by like, Dr. Dre, who sampled, woo, 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 woo. So that was the fun part about back then. Now- And who did they thank? Who did they thank in their notes? Because that was going to be interesting. That right. was going to have a hand in it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Dude, I love this podcast. This is awesome. I'm... Thanks, Jesse. I wish we had you on sooner, but hey, it is, you know, we got you now, right? Now, now I'm now. Hooked. now you're never going to get rid of me. No, we don't like, want to get rid like of you. Happy man. VD, I guess. We'll, we'll make it like a, every couple months or something. We'll, we'll do a check in with you or something like that. Dude, I'll be your man on the street. Whatever. Sounds good to me. Wherever Jesse. you want to send me. So funny because we're talking about uh, uh, records. So my first record I remember is my sister had the uh, Michael Jackson Thriller album. And I remember opening them up, reading that. And the thing is with that Thriller album is I couldn't even play that fucking album because of the song Thriller. And I knew that it was on there somewhere. And if I put, you know, go to play the record and be on Thriller, it scared the shit out of me. Never touch an album again. Yeah, our church was like all up in arms about that song. Wow. <laughs> For years, I had to hide my rock shirts at my friend's garage. I'd go to school, go to his garage, put it on. I'd have to take it off on my way back home because my mom would kill me if she saw like <laughs> a dancing shirt. No way, dude. Right. Wow. I used to sneak in my sister room and play uh, Two Shorts Born to Mac album. Dude, that was the <laughs> shit. And you know, it's funny. I, I remember sneaking in with my friend and listening to Parliament's There's a String Attached to My Thing because that was the nasty music of its day. Right, right, right. Yeah. So and you know, Two Short is an excellent example. Two Short is one of the most badass producingist artist out there he is still ki killing it and and he has done it without ever ever compromising a single shred of integrity he stayed loyal to everything he believes in and he's done it on his own and he sells out stadiums he doesn't necessarily have radio hits but then again neither is black sabbath and uh you know some things aren't meant for that but they do exactly on their own terms and it's real dude there's no difference between almost uh uh, these are not freaky tales and blow the whistle, dude. Yeah, yeah. But see, I, I argue because I'm from Oakland, so I argue with these young kids. I'm like, dude, Too Short is 50 plus years old. So I was listening to him when I was in the third grade. Yep. So his reason why guys like him are so phenomenal is because he never changed. He, he has the same basic ass rapping style, right? He's made the word bitch so phenomenally famous. <laughs> <laughs> and what he's done is he's been able to still, you know, transcend from the early 80s and it's 2021 at this point, and he's still doing it. So he's like one of the greatest to ever do it. And quick fact note, he's a um, he's one of the only artists to have a song with three of the legends, Jay-Z, Tupac Shakur, and Biggie Smalls. Huh. Dude, and well, and that that speaks volumes. That you could almost look at it like they all three wanted to have a song with him. Yep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, mm -hmm. you know, what's my favorite word? BS, why they got to say it like short? B Dude, <laughs> I, 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 I have been a, 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 a huge fan of Too Short for a long time. And I will point out, you know, in this day of so much divisiveness, that me, as I am, I've gone to a, at least 32 short shows in my day. Wow. And have had the most beautiful time every that's time. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's and awesome. You know what I mean? This, it, 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 and it was, I've always believed that punk rock is an attitude and that public enemy is just as punk rock as Black Flag is just as punk rock as George Clinton is just as punk rock as, you know, uh, 99 Problems. That's one of the most fucking punk rock, rock and roll songs. I don't give a shit who it is. Like, you can't fuck with that. Pardon my language. You can't, you can't deny it. You know what I mean? Like, you can't screw with it hey, hey <laughs> digital underground was I, th I i don't think digital underground gets the credit that they that no they way dude 
No. They were super huge in the late 80s, early 90s, and they were basically a rap <clears throat> uh, collection parliament. that was based off of Parliament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dude, Sir Nose Devoid of Funk. That's the Humpty Nose. Like, yep. he's Sir, because my first musical obsession, I'm from Greenville, South Carolina, and Parliament was it for me. Oh, yeah. And my grandmother gave me some money that she wanted me, I think, to invest in my life after college. And when the Mothership reunion tour took place, I was like, that was my Grateful Dead. And I went and followed them for like 64 shows. And it changed my life, dude. And, wow. and I've never seen a band go on at midnight and play till six in the morning, ever. Holy shit. And be able to do it. And be able to do it, dude. Like, wow. that's like some incredible, incredible shit. And I actually was so excited by that memory, I even forgot what we're talking about right now. <laughs> that's how excited about music I get, dude. Oh, we we gonna jump into it. Let me see. I got, I'm, I'm first up, man. So. Let's 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 get to it. So, who or what got you into music? Like, were you just was it just in you? Did you always want to do it as a kid, or when did you when did you get that aha moment? Like, yo, let me do some music. Well, it's like two phase. I loved music. I come from a, a, a gospel rooted family, so from the time I was a little boy, um, I was around singing and people singing. And being from the south, you know, a lot of the people in my family are musicians. My dad was a musician. But it wasn't until I saw Parliament and then I, my first album was Kiss and even then I didn't want to make music. But it, it wasn't until I saw uh, John Lee Hooker perform right before he died. And that man was eternal. And I was like, he's, I want to be like him. I want to do this. And, and it was really, to be honest with you, man, it was like being a werewolf my whole life and not seeing my first full moon till I was 30. Like, I really, you know the feeling of you really have no choice. This is what you were meant to do. Absolutely. I never wanted to be in a rock band. I wanted to be Ronald Reagan, dude. And my ex-wife and I went through a divorce that was awful. I wrote my first record in a week. My best friend showed up. He was in a platinum selling band and, and almost like here I am, like the lottery. But I was made for it. Oh, yeah. Nice. So to answer your question, four weeks ago. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but like you said, you, um, I never thought I would coach, uh, mentor, train, teach. And it's like, God, like you said, God has a, a, a funny it is. way of bringing things to where they need to be. So <clears throat> all the selfish wants of me wanting to play pro ball and division one scholarship out of high school and all that stuff was my my selfish wants and desires but he allowed me to get on that journey and that was all like a battleground to prepare me for what i'm doing now and that's it, it. yeah and, and you know you were talking earlier about the exponential development of maturity and when it comes to my journey in music what initially got me on it has modified so, you know, when you first get into something, like when you're a rookie at anything, it's the first time. When you go around the cycle one time, I think you get to a point where you decide, do I want to go again or do I? And then sometimes the reasons for wanting to go again modify. You become more mature. And, and sometimes, you know, there are bands that sold millions of records and nobody knows where they are. And then yeah. there's Bob Dylan. You know what I mean? Yeah. I've always wanted to be like a, a Bob Dylan. And he doesn't have to make pop records all the time. He makes albums that are appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. You're a wizard. That's why a wizard eventually ends up in his own uh, hilltop with his own uh, pupils who come and sit and listen to his wisdom. Like, that's an incredibly important mandate of God. Yeah. Otherwise, the, the experience that he gives us, it would be for not if we didn't ex claim it in his glory for everyone to see. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so eventually in high school, you met uh, Josh Homey. Apparently, Josh stopped a bully from picking on you. What can you tell our listeners about that? Well, you know, our relationship is, is very interesting. It, our mothers went to the same, well, they went to Bob Jones University at the same time and didn't know it. And, uh, but when my parents uh, uh, divorced, I moved to Palm Desert in 19, he was the only other redhead I knew. And he was a giant. And, and he had a full ride scholarship to UCLA. He was a giant football player and, but rock and roll, he had a full, he had a professional touring band when he was in high school. And I was at my very first party I went to, I got bullied a little bit cause I was tiny. I used to be just tiny. And 
uh, I was weird. I'm a weird dude. I get it. So sometimes I got picked on, but I got thrown in the pool and this giant dude named Travis Eagleson wouldn't let me out. And <laughs> I'm just sitting in this pool, just like, okay, I guess this is my party. It was like a John Hughes film. And then uh, I hear this voice go, let him out. And I looked, turned around and there was Joshua and he had this look on his face. And I was a big lesson for me. This wasn't so much a lesson in you got to have big friends because yeah. uh, that could have been the lesson. But he lifted me up because he is truly a giant. He lifted me up out of the pool and set me down. And when he, he gave me a hug and he goes, at least try and defend yourself. So at least makes you worth defending. Wow. And that was a and I that that stuck with me. I, I obsessed on it the whole night. Like, what did he mean by that? Like. And I understand what he means. Like, I should have tried to defend myself. I shouldn't have resigned myself to it because it didn't make me as, as appealing to be defended even. You know, it's easier to want to defend that thing that wants to fight. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a valuable yeah. lesson. Yeah. It taught me to be the big friend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so <clears throat> did you and Josh have to have like, did you guys have aspirations to be rock stars? You know, that's funny. Joshua started a band in high school and I think he saw, he's one of these dudes, I call him the red genius. When he sees, especially in business potential, he identifies it and he goes for it. And from the time we were in high school, he was like, you really should be in a band. You should be an entertainer. An entertainer. And I was like, no, I went to Boys State. I, uh, I was salutary in my class. I wanted, I truly, I worked for Sonny Bono and my goal was eventually to run for public office. That was, you know, that was where I was headed. And uh, I always thought, oh, come on, dude, you were made by God to lead people. You're gonna be in a rock band. But um, I never had aspirations until I saw the opportunity. And once I saw that, I wanted to, I always wanted to make him never sorry that he brought me into the rock world. Aim small, miss small. So I had small goals. Hey, so <laughs> my grandfather, he's a, he's originally from Mississippi, Macomb, Mississippi, <clears throat> my mom's dad. So he, he told me many years ago, he said, Dante, well, if you, if you aim for the moon and you fall on the star, what are you? You're still a damn star. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, you gotta, you gotta go for the gusto, man. Like, I think a lot of people, <clears throat> they get they get caught in caught up in living mundane, boring lives because God gives every one of us, each and one of every each each one of us a superpower, right? Right. And in, in, in your life is there's a destiny. You're destined to do something, but your job is to figure out what is the suit. Like we're all X Men. Right. <laughs> And we got to figure out what that what that special thing that we have that we can do very well, right? So, our 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 journey in life is to figure out what that is and then max it out and then share it. That's our gift back to God. So, <clears throat> I just feel like what you just said is it it it, it sounds so familiar because that's the same thing I believe in the same thing I preach. It's like yo, you we I think people get caught up in they're very good at this but they spend their lives banging their head trying to do that, that they're not right. good in. <laughs> and, and, and never letting the facts dictate the terms of their decisions. I'm always a believer that you can't be 10 feet tall if you start by cutting yourself off at the knees. Yeah. And, and, and if you have a, an, an, an imagination limit, like most people, they'll never think and conceive of the stuff that they wouldn't do. So when someone does something that they wouldn't do, they can't expect it. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. My grandpa, he had, you know, I think you and I have a lot in common, brother. I think uh, because my grandfather was, he was a great man and he had some funny sayings. But um, he, if anyone said anything's possible, he'd go, hell no. Everything's possible if you think about it. And you can do everything in one move. Like Kojak was sat Sunday night and we ate uh, dinner with my grandparents every Sunday night. And so we'd eat dinner and I got to sit in my grandpa's lap for Kojak. So I'd get all excited. And he would get so pissed at me because I would get up, go to the bathroom, I'd get a drink and he'd be like, God damn it, son. If you think about it, you can do everything in one move. <laughs> so when I combined, you can do everything in one move and everything is possible right now. That's pretty much sky is open. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. I want to be amazing. tall for real. Cause the 10 foot tall motherfucker, he's got to have a big, you know, you know, what I mean. <laughs> artistic, yeah, artistic, we know where you're going. <laughs> 
Because I'm a bright side kind of dude. I'm a believer that even the worst blowjob is still amazing. And if you look at it like that, it's kind of like there's never a bad day. Not at all. <laughs> so, so back when uh, Josh and his first band, Caius, they had quite the, uh, the following in uh, Palm Desert and played uh, generator parties. Were you ever at any of those parties? And what do you remember about them? them? Yeah. Was, because, you know, the desert is a retirement community. So everything we had, we had to make it ourselves. We didn't have bands coming to, in our towns. So if, if we wanted to go and we had to go to LA, our whole world had to be self-generated. And anything you did within city limits was going to get busted. Ch children and kids were really just kind of like an irritation. So the generation, the generator was a necessity. And we had to go far enough out into the desert to where we could literally see people coming a mile away so that yeah. we could, because the fine, if you got busted with a generator, I mean, dude, it was like 15 grand right then and there, but <laughs> it also made for some of the most amazing hijinks. And uh, Joshua, Mario Lolly was the dude that was like the king of our world and Sons of Kai, it was called Cats and Jammer, then Sons of Caius, and then they're, you know, they're high school dudes and they're touring around the world. It's uncommon. So Josh started Queen, the, 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 the group Queen, Queen? Yeah, he started, he was in Caius and then uh, Queens of the Stone Age started, technically Eagles of Death Metal started before Queens. And just so we know what Queens of the Stone Age means, it's, a, it's an old Palm Springs gay community term. It means like an unhip homosexual, like, oh, don't invite him. He's a Queen of the Stone Age. He loves Liberace. Like, because wow. we grew up in the gay mecca of, of the world. So we hear this shit all the time. Like, oh God, what a Queen of the Stone Age. It just means unhip uh, queen. Wow. So, so that was in what, 96? Uh, yeah, like around, yeah. There was a label called Man's Ruin that was owned by an artist named Frank Kozik and Joshua, you know, he was kind of like thinking about retiring from music. He went to business school, but he was made for it. And, and his, he came back and he did Queens of the Stone Age. And at the time, man, there was nothing like it in the world. You know, it was falsettos. It was heavy music with beautiful melodies. These things weren't happening at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't like you were either macho or you and was like, oh, wow, a big, beautiful Ginger Elvis. Great. And <laughs> with this great name and, and Rob Halford's on it. And uh, it just it exploded in the underground first. Our All of our the family of musicians that we're a part of, we're, we would all consider ourselves to be a band's band before we're, you know, we're band's bands. And that was definitely true of Queens and Caius. And then their, their effect was after the fact. They broke up and then, then their popularity soared that then led into Queens. So it was kind of a beautiful inevitability. Yeah. So speaking of great names, where did the name Eagles of Death Metal come from? So Joshua, myself, and my friend, uh, uh, Cole Lou, and our friend, uh, Kevin Lee, we were at a bar called the... Uh, Beer Hunter, and this dude was listening to Winds of Change by the Scorpions on the jukebox, which is the least rocking song in the world. And dude, he was like doing these like inappropriate rock outs to this slow ballad and everyone's like, what the fuck is wrong with this dude? Yeah. And he looks at us and he goes, what, man, this is rock and roll. And we're like, no, it's not, dude. And he's like, yeah, it is, this is heavy metal. And, and my friend Cole goes, no, it's not, dude. And he goes, this is death metal, dude. And Josh <laughs> goes, dude, it's like the Eagles of death metal. <laughs> and then we were like, cha -ching. so later on that night, we were in my friend Kevin's VW bus that had the license plate doomed. Could have been more perfect. And I was making fun of, fun of death metal because our friend liked it. I'm like, dude, play the Eagles of death metal. So the following morning, my roommate wakes me up and goes, dude, Josh is at the door and he's being annoying. And I came to the door and Josh was like, dude, I haven't been able to stop thinking about Eagles of death metal. What do you think it would sound like? Come on, let's go. We got, I was like, whoa. That's always been Josh. So from Jump Street, this, the day after the name came up, he was like, come on, Boots, you got stuff to do. And I'm like, what? <laughs> but then I got married. And I didn't want to be in a band. And he went on with Queens of the Stone Age. But unbeknownst to me, he was constantly telling people that he had a band called Eagles of Death Metal. And then when I went through my divorce, I used to weigh about 280 pounds. For real, like I was a big old boy, you know what I mean? And you know, when you can go, you can go through life changing mo mo situations that transform you. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I lost my virginity to my ex-wife. I was very devout and I went through a very typical 
divorce where I was like, if this is what I get for serving, then I don't care about anything anymore. You know what I mean? And I got despondent. And the only friend that my mother knew of that she felt could have any effect on me was Joshua. So she called him and said, I need you to talk to Jesse. I'm worried about him. And he was on tour in Australia and he came back from tour and he came to my house and he put all my firearms in a pillowcase, put them in his trunk and let, and then uh, came back inside. And he leaned up against my computer and the screensaver came up and I had recorded a song, I Only Want You, just because I wanted to experiment with a multi-track recording program. And he goes, what is this? Can you make more? And I went, dude, I've written like 18 of these. And he's like, okay. <laughs> and he borrowed my mom's car and he drove me to Hollywood and here I am. Nice. So what artists in particular, I know we talked about Parliament and some of the other, other groups earlier, but what, what were, what were some of the main groups or artists that were a huge influence for you? Well, I used the Keith Richards tuning and I, I, I would consider myself in terms of my guitar style, a son of Keith Richards. But um, I also, I, I'm a super uh, obsessor on James Brown, especially the hardest working man in show business and the Mr. Dynamite phase. It's one of my most, you know, that's, that's, that's a dude who's influenced everyone, including Michael, everybody. And, um, but I also love uh, uh, like Heat Wave. I love like uh, the uh, the disco jazz of the '70s and '80s, and I also love Black Flag. You know, so um, in terms of my performance style, uh, I'm kind of trying to be like the Richard Simmons of rock and roll. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, because it seems like I believe in sticking with what you're good at. Whatever I like, this is the way he put me together. So I guess hello time to work out <laughs> oh yeah uh, how have subscription music apps like spotify and apple music changed the music industry well they revealed the uh, ability of record labels to dominate licensing which is where the money's at but um i have to be honest and, and i'm starting to lose faith in the overall integrity of social media and, and uh, digital platforms because they keep such a secrecy to their bookkeeping. You know, uh, when a song is played on the radio, that's considered a real play and you get a percentage of whatever and then that's uh, your, your, your uh, publishing fees. But in order for it to count as an actual play online, say for example, and it, it's arbitrary, it can be 10,000 plays on Spotify in order to, for it to equal a single actual play. And then on Spotify, for example, the only artist that gets the credit is the very first artist selected on the channel. If it starts auto selecting, none of those artists are considered the play. Wow. Crazy, which I think is fundamentally just unnecessary. Are you serious? Yeah. I, I don't, and, 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 you, and you made a great point. I never really thought about it till you said that, but it's all digital, so who knows? Exactly who knows. And that's why there's such a specific, you know, normally terms are legal, like uh, the word gift. That's a legal term. If you've ever filed any IRS claims, the word gift is, is a is a legal term. And virtual is a term that denotes a difference between actual. So virtual is whatever it wants to be. And, and because there's an implied bully tactic of, well, if you do anything that we don't like, we can just blitz you out because for the artist the goal too also has always been for the song i mean radio was free you could just listen to it we make our music in touring and in our our merch and our licensing and our ability to do that the album is actually only an advert advertisement for that week's that that year's circus you know it's here's why you can come here it's just an excuse to tour some bands are so lucky like say the rolling stones they just put out a record to have a reason to tour yeah. And, and we model ourselves like a true circus. I don't want there to be any reason to need to tour other than to bring the joy of rock and roll to your town. You know, so uh, it, it kind of like the digital world is dubious and it it's still in flux. And because we can't really determine the intentions of the platform in the old days, money talked. I understood that everybody was out for money and I could bet on that. But sometimes it seems like businesses make decisions in the virtual world that are counterintuitive to business. Mm -hmm. like, the, like who would want to really shut down in a business? And why, you know, like, why would a, a, book, a brick and mortar store ever really want to, you know, 
there's always a reason. Yeah. And it's yeah. never a good one. An agenda, an ulterior motive. I mean, like you said, you never know. Um, that's that's crazy because as an artist, you want to get paid for your art. But see, that goes back to what I was talking about earlier with the way things have become when people don't really value the art and they're just, I just got to get something out. I'm going to do the most outlandish shit I could possibly do because that's what they call it, clout chasing or whatever. Right. I can get, I can, I can start, like I could say some shit that I don't even believe in. I can start controversy because yeah. I know that's going to generate on the social media platforms. People are talking about me. So instead of the art being the main focal point now, it's the, the, all the other shit that, that and you then you know you hit the nail on the head and then there's the nefarious untalked about side of that not only can you pursue the clout part of it but anyone you view as competition or just because they disrespected you at a bar you can generate a destruction of their life wow via yeah. an unchecked accusation and yeah. because the medium itself is like allowing it you know clearly that's where their heart lies you know it, it doesn't take a genius you don't want people going to stores physically if you need them to be online. Right. And the best way to make sure people are online is if you don't let them leave their house. Yeah. So obviously there's a vested interest in digital court. Like there should have been a disclaimer when this pandemic started, there should have been a disclaimer from Amazon, everyone. We ha stand to gain much money and profit <laughs> by this. Yeah. So calling ourselves a hero is going to seem really gross. Wow. They Never started. even thought of it like that. <laughs> Didn't he just become the richest man in, in the world? Dude, right out of the gate, the first two months of the, of the shutdown, they, this is kind of a gross fact, but the amount of wealth that was in, say, 90% of the people's hands was consolidated within the first two months. Wow. And it sure does seem like, I mean, I know this is crazy, but it seems like a lot of companies like Target and Walmart were in on it because they were prepared for shutdowns and for the digital market. Facebook already had a store in place. Like, yeah. as we all know from the business we've done, before the season's announced, we kind of know the way it's gonna go based on what's happening internally and yeah. shit that's unannounced. And we can take advantage of it. I'm sure that's true in, in the business world too. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So walk us through the, the, the creative process of, 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 of one of your albums. How did you guys prepare for uh, putting an album together? Well, it normally starts with Eagles of Death Metal. It starts with me. And I'll put together about 25 to 30 song pieces, just ideas. I, I, the digital age is, it has allowed us the ability to realize artistic ideas really quickly and develop them to a point where they can be stored and almost put on ice and taken out much more developed. So then I'll give them to Josh and he does this hilarious thing where he basically dumps them onto a table and goes, this piece should go here, this piece should go here. And then, uh, then we go into the studio where he becomes the drummer because everything in my, you know, obviously by some of my influence, everything's beat driven. And I use the James Brown principle of songwriting where everything's based, everything's a drum. Every instrument's treated like a drum. And if every instrument, you can hear it in James Brown music. That's why the, the, like, the weird noises, the ee, 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 you could almost hear it if you wanted it to be there. And, uh, and normally when it's, unless it's deep inspiration, I don't like to write about sad things. I like to write about winning, winning and getting laid because that didn't happen a lot in high school. So I'm like making up for a lot of time, you know what I mean? Or sometimes I just want a song that I can Billy Idol in front of the mirror with, you know what I mean? Like, that's good enough for me. I really, I really appreciate what I see as my role as an entertainer. And if the whole shithouse were to go up in flames tomorrow, the greatest honor of my life would be that I get to entertain my friends. So entertaining them is where the song ultimately starts. Right. Yeah. So I'd say you guys are probably the most, one of the most entertaining bands. Um, one of the most positive bands I've ever listened to. I mean, everything like I could be in the most pissed off, angriest mood, go on my truck, go for a drive, throw on Eagles of death metal and be happy within five minutes. I mean, and that, 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 you know, that's, that's a lot, right? It, 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 it's, it's enough. You know what I mean? Like if, if, and, and 
uh, my whole life has been one long blessing, one long, uh, uh, beautiful, wonderful gift. I mean, just the fact that I'm in a rock and roll band that's been as successful as we are is a magic gift that a lot of people want and most don't get. And I appreciate every second of it. And I especially appreciate the reason why I get to do it. And that's because people love my music, you know, and, and I can promise you that even when it seems like the chips are down, and everything is just uh, against you, and everything is, is even death, that there is a beautiful element to be seen. God never leaves us alone, and I've witnessed that. Yeah. So I have to testify to that, yeah. and I'm very happy about it. <laughs> who, would you, uh, who would you most like to collaborate with? Dr. Dre, or uh, I would love to have an album produced by Andre 3000. That's been like where That's I think great. I would where I could really see something bitching happen because I know he loves music. He's a true lover of music. He's a true student of music. And I can tell he loves the Beatles in Parliament and I'm a Parliament fanatic. You know, that those albums, the, the first early Outkast albums, those were huge. You know, they were kind of in a way like you, they were a little bit more like Digital Underground, just credited, you know, a little bit more drive. Most people don't even know Tupac was the DJ for Digital Underground. You know what I mean? He's in that movie, Nothing But Trouble. Yeah, he was a, he was a roadie, and even though he's a he's an East Coast guy, he he says he's from Oakland because yeah. he used to be a roadie, and then he got his first shot uh, when the Nothing But Trouble movie. They let him jump on that song uh, all around. Mm, same song, yeah, yeah, yeah. Same yeah. so, song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is such a killer movie. I kind of want to remake that movie, but make it a horror movie version. For real, for real, for real. That I I loved that movie. It was crazy how it, how the family was in the in the in dude the and the dick nose thing. Like the part, like because dude, I'm from the south. Believe me, I've I've literally been face to face with cops who go, "I hear you either surf or you're queer if you're from California." And I'm like, "Well, I don't surf." Beam, pop, boom. You know, it's like they didn't like that. So, dude, that's that shit and. The, the roller coaster, why was there never a theme park that actually had that ride? Right. <laughs> like, a, and it could have been, a, like, it should have been at the theme park for the Hard Rock. Ah, man, all these ideas too late. <laughs> we'll get them. Hey, no, it's never too late. It's, it's, hey, right. Dude, maybe this is why. Everything is possible. <laughs> right now. <laughs> well, dude, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I think we just found our, our triumvirate right here. We're gonna start an amusement park that's gonna be sports rock and roll. Let's do it. And it'll have a school of rock and an athletic and a gymnasius, like in the classic sense. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm down. Like That'll the days pop. of Charles Atlas. <laughs> That'll pop. That'll pop. You know what I mean? Like, I think that would be cool. Just like it's, it's staying fit, staying healthy, living life well, not living life scared. Can never be scared. Can't, Can't be afraid of the flu. That's for damn sure. I've lived, I've lived half my life being scared. And this year, I'm, you know what? Fuck it. I'm done being scared. I'm finally going to college. Uh, I'm going to take uh, web development uh, in September and uh, move on with life, right? Tired of being scared, man. Absolutely. Dude, you get busy living or get busy dying. I know it's a, it's a statement from a, a movie, but it's a true statement, you know? And I, 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 I don't have it in me to let the bad guys win. In fact, I kind of feel like I'm going to live my last breath making sure that the bad guys are as pissed off as they can be. Because, you know, if like Adolf Hitler wrote you a letter that said, I don't like you, you'd be like, fuck, that's going to get me laid. By the way, <laughs> this asshole hates me. So thank you very much. Like, that's what you want, you know? Yeah. You got a percent. You, hey, you, what, what is it saying? You miss all of the shots you never take? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's it. Uh, you'll never know unless you try. These things are corny, but, and, and trying... The expectation of success on the first try is kind of uh, unrealistic. The expectation of knowledge and the ability to get a step further is is realistic. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Operating in a team, knowing your role, identifying leadership, and being able to be cool with them leading, and having leadership that is able to be followed too. You know, these things are all required. Yeah, I mean, it's a. It, uh. You just, you just gotta be, for me, I'm optimistic and I'm self-driven and I'm self-motivated. And I feel like 
who would have ever thought a oh, little badass Dante would would make it to where he made it. So if I've done that and I was in the you know I made it to the one one percentile of elite people in that that athletic world, man, I could do anything if I did that. <laughs> then I could Dude, do especially that. coming from Oakland, you know, statistically, it's, people would say that it was set against you. The odds were already against you. Right. That, you know, you may not even make it out of childhood. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. so it, it actually further reduces down the one percentile that you're in. Right. And if, if weird Jesse can tour around the world and have terrorists try to come kill him and they still can't bring him down, then y'all can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> For real. For real, for real. Do you think, cause I was actually, we, we have a gym, right? A facility. So I was actually just kind of listening to a playlist. One of the one of the ladies in there had a playlist and I'm listening to some of this stuff. And it's funny how it, it segues into this question. What are, what are your thoughts on like copyright infringement or ideas or creativity? Because it sounds like everybody is just recycling the same shit and then the people that recycle it don't do it good like it's just like if you if you sample something right you have to do it good like we talked about earlier when uh, uh, uh roger and zap the more bounce when you a hey, when you sample that you better do it right eric sermon you knew they out. loved it you knew they loved it when they sampled it mm -hmm. the thing is now is that it's become a, 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 a data analysis machine where uh, the cycle of nostalgia has been identified. So when you, you have these things that are being recycled, they're being like turned into uh, like, uh, like the difference in, in fonts in Photoshop, you know what I mean? Almost like that. Like there's applications in Pro Tools that have a, this thing you put in your mouth and you blow into and it makes real trumpet sounds like you don't even like and and it's it's uh it's counterproductive in my opinion you know what i mean like i i think that well, the technology like, has stifled us yeah there's no more musicians like you can a guy that can have absolutely symphonies zero. are going away right yep a guy could have no knowledge of an instrument, but he can hit buttons and now he's a big time producer. Like I'm, I'm throwing. See copyright infringement, like there's nothing new under the sun and you steal from the best, but there's a difference. Nobody's going to tell me that the Beach Boys weren't aware that they like Chuck Berry. Right. And everyone knows that Angus Young wants to be Chuck Berry, but that's just being honest. And that's the difference between being possessed by the same uh, influence as your heroes because you love them and you're channeling the same things you're channeling because you're suffering the way they are, as opposed to someone who is just understanding that every 20 years things come around again. So they're just getting ahead of the curve and going 80s. Yeah. Or, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and having someone who dresses them. Yeah. And in a style, it's like a lot of times, you know, the digital media world's always been fake, in my opinion. Like, I don't know why it's a shock. Twitter, for example, always started off with a fake amount of followers. From yeah. Jump Street, it was about like so that people could make it seem like they had a million followers when eh, it's not organic. And it was built into it behind the scenes. The good folks at Twitter knew that. Yeah. You know, that's where I think uh, the copyright infringement and the ability. Uh, if, if someone's able to play your song in a playlist on Spotify and you're not getting any credit for it or payment for it unless it's the first one chosen, that's copyright infringement. Yeah, that's that's. That's taking advantage of artists who are putting their heart and soul into things. And, you know, it's not free. In order for us to be obsessed, we have to have free time. You can't train for uh, the Super Bowl unless you have the time to spend it, live it 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. So Josh has spent some time hanging out with Trent Reznor uh, a little bit. Josh went through a near-death experience. Uh, they drank a lot of coffee together. Did you ever get a chance to hang out with Trent Reznor? And uh, what kind of person is he like? Trent's a friend of mine. I, I've toured with Trent. He's one of the finest individuals I've known. And he is one of the artists who gave me personally, in terms of me being at the helm of Eagles of Death Metal and touring independently, a lot of the opportunity and the chance that I had to make it. So uh, he's, an, he's, a, he's a godfather of, of our world. And he's been a selfless 
a very uh, uh, available person to those of us. So he's, I think Trent Reznor is one of those dudes who fortunately look, I, understands and accepts his role as a, as a, uh, a person we all look up to. Yeah. He comes across as being very, very serious. He's genuine, uh, he's serious, he seems serious, but he's not mean. He's fully capable, he's hilarious and he loves you. He's just, he's got an intensity to him. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I love his music. I am a huge Nine Inch Nails fan. I've been trying to talk him into going to Ten Inch Nails, just one inch <laughs> nail more. Just like, like that might be the way to bring it into the future. Like, you know, upgrade it. Maybe by the year 2030, we're at 11 inches of nail, but <laughs> slow down. Let's just go one inch at a time. We're, we're still staying at nine. <laughs> oh, I got France watching me right now. Yes. That's awesome. First concert you ever went to? Kiss, Destroyer. Nice. That's awesome. Mine was Obi Trice. Nice. Rapper. Yeah, it was it was actually a good show. He didn't come on stage until 1 a.m. and uh, was on there until about 2.30 or whatever. It was a fun night. My first concert without an adult supervisor was the church. If you had a time machine, would you go back or forward in time? Well, I'd have a time machine. I'd go simultaneously back and forward. Just kidding. You'd it would be, be a giant up. jack off. Um, no, um, uh, <laughs> I would go around time. Round time. Boom. That's a good one. Never That's even an thought answer of it. That seems to be deep, but doesn't mean anything. <laughs> what are your thoughts on flat earthers? Oh, yeah. They're the true geniuses of the world. <laughs> um, I've been in a I've been very fortunate to experience some cool things. And I've been in, in the very plane that Apollo 13 scenes were filmed in that goes into these giant. Wow. And okay. I've seen the curvature of the earth. Yeah. And I understand how perspective works and perspective of, of we, we are all, we don't understand the lesson from molecules. Our space as little humans is relationship to the earth. Our ability to perceive the curvature is limited. That's what doesn't make everything seem like a fisheye. Yeah. I, but I, I think it's very telling that we're coming back to, I mean, are we going to start killing all our cats and have another black plague? I mean, what's next? Digital witches, shovel witches. Right. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. A bunch of bullshit. Digital voodoo. <laughs> Dude, I'm about to be, the new virus will be like digital voodoo. I put a digital curse. That's what a virus is. <laughs> Dude, I just read, dude, we just did a digital curse, digital voodoo. Yes, dude. <laughs> we awesome. introduce an element of the superstitious and we'll go spooky. Ha ha. There we go. New virus. Uh, what was your favorite venue to play or what is your favorite venue to play? The Henry Fonda Theater, the Black Cat, Coco's. Um, Market Hall, I mean, I have a, but Henry Fonda and the Troubadour are my two most treasured, important places to play. Okay. Favorite song to perform? Somebody else's. Um, uh, favorite song to perform is Speaking in Tongues. Nice. That's a good one. What's the weirdest thing a fan has ever done for you? Ever done for me? Yeah. Other than asking you to be on their podcast. No, no, no. Um, produced a child for me. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, they did that to me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, uh, well, there have been some weird things, man. I can tell you that. But uh, um, uh, someone named, had a star named for me once and sent it to me. Um, someone... Uh, decided to be my bodyguard and follow me around for like 40 shows and scare the shit out of me that was interesting Ooh. and then someone actually impersonated me and took my place and it may be that person who i am right no, no i'm just kidding <laughs> um, i'm weird so because i'm so weird i, I have a, it's difficult for me to to identify that because everything is weird with me <laughs> If you were a pro athlete instead of a musician, what sport would you play? <coughs> I saw you have football cards earlier. Football, either <coughs> I would play cricket or professional soccer, or I would be a baseball scout. 
Um, just like Swiggy. Swiggy from Lenny and Swiggy was a baseball stout. He just died. Yeah. Do you see yourself as an artist or an entertainer? As a wizard. As a wizard. Yeah. I've heard you uh, talk about that before, wanting to be a wizard. I am an entertainer for sure. But uh, I just, I consider myself a, a, a piper. Okay. A pied piper with a Three. big swing dick. <laughs> Three favorite rock albums of all time. Ooh, rock albums. That's a tough one. The or, Sonics, the Sonics Boom. Yeah. Beggar's Banquet. And Nervous Breakdown by Black Flag. Nice. How hard was it to uh, decide to return to Paris after the shooting? Well, not not hard at all i mean there was it was definitely difficult but it was never off the table that was i i i truly was thinking about returning as i was running for my life like that that it was how to return it was never if it was always how so i set myself to the task of being as well as i could you know yeah i i, I to be honest with you i'll tell you some truth i when we went back and played with uh, U2, I had no intention of going on stage and I was sort of tricked into going. I wasn't aware of the fact that they intended for us to perform until the show. Mm -hmm. And I got challenged like, what are you, a pussy kind of shit? And it worked, but uh, I, if it hadn't been for U2, I never would have performed again. Wow. Yeah, that was, um, I remember waking up and seeing that on the news. Um, I was at work and I had a nap, woke up and uh, saw the Paris attacks and just, just blown away of, you know, that, that, that somebody or, or a group of people could do such a thing. Absolutely terrible. And um, I, I feel terrible for everybody who was involved and, and knew somebody that lost a life or lost a loved one or, you know, it was pretty you know, bad. I gained a, a really seriously interesting perspective on it and I saw people jump in front of bullets for their friends and I saw the world put all differences aside and come together for the purpose of freedom of expression and of, of the protection of life and of joy. And I saw everywhere I looked the best that the world had to offer. And though it was at a terrible cost and though if it was up to me, I wish that I had never seen it that's irrelevant i have and it quite frankly is the most beautiful thing that i've ever gone through it's terrible but i learned the wisdom i learned i mean you don't really get much from something like that but perspective and the perspective that i have tells me that beauty can be terrible and it can come at great cost and and uh it's the kind of beauty you may never have wanted to see but once you see it you have to bear witness to it and it's beautiful and it's holy and everyone's reaction, the, the things that have grown from it, from the, uh, 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 from the, the foundation uh, uh, on behalf of my friend Nick to Life of Paris, all of these things have become forces of good. And everyone that was involved in it has got this drive of life that is so inspiring that I, I've been able to be blessed by seeing the effect of their drive for life and their refusal to give in to affect millions literally of people so I, I i look at it as probably one of the greatest honors of my life that i've ever been involved in though i wish i'd never seen it you know yeah yeah so you guys of... sorry you, you guys did the, the score for super troopers 2 what was that, that like was awesome yeah that was awesome dude I mean, I tend to do more scores, but uh, make I mean, it's a weird way to make music. When you make a song, it's planned out, you know, but this, you're watching the movie and you're making music that's, it's an addendum. It's not the focus. And, and it's not meant to necessarily over, over, because I would write them pieces of music and they would go, dude, this is too funny. And it's distracting. It's like, awesome. I mean, it's cool. I actually ended up with like three albums worth of music out of it, dude. Nice. Are you going to use any of that? Fuck yeah. I mean, hell yes. <laughs> Don't worry about language, man. It's all good, brother. Um, how Fuck do you, yes. <laughs> how do you prepare for a live show? Well, 
I have this big, you know, those like push carts, like those like big industrial push carts. Yeah. I have one of those to lay my massive dick on and I just <laughs> wheel it around the venue. Uh, and then the process of whapping it around my legs and up so that you can't really tell is pretty extensive. And then I have the ultimate fear of boner. Boner fears are serious because as, as anyone well knows, it could crush me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I listen to music and I go hang out with everyone in the front of the of this venue in line because honestly, we're all this. Those are my rock and rollers, so I love them the most. I get prepared for the show by getting ready to know who I'm entertaining. I actually, I guess that's a good way to look at it. I like to know who's there, so I spend most of my time handing out candy and getting to know everyone. <laughs> that's awesome. Do you get nervous before a show? I've never had stage fright in my life and it's generated a lot of, of hatred on the part of my, my peers. I remember on the very first tour we did with Placebo, I came off stage at the Middle East and I walked into the dressing room to Josh going, and he never gets stage fright and it's pissing me off. <laughs> I think he was on the phone with Mark Lanigan. It was pretty fucking funny. That's awesome. I get nervous even like in the boardroom at work. With, People with, only with know what you tell them and I accept that. They only know what you tell them. You don't always use words but they only know what you tell them. And I just tell them I'm badass. <laughs> uh, I'm going to use that brother. It's my new line. I'm just badass, right? That's it. Well, you are baby. That's the truth. Right. Hey man, I got my Eagles of death metal t-shirt on right now. Bingo. Right now See, I, I am badass. Guess. Right. Hello. Exactly. So uh, the boots electric theme video reminds me of when I was 15 and uh, our hockey team down at a tournament down in Duncan on Vancouver Island here. We, uh, we got a porno stuck in the VCR in a hotel room. And uh, the Boots Electric theme, the video reminds me of that for some reason. Probably just all the porno and all that, right? It's because of the porno that's stuck in my mind, you know? Yeah. Like, it's always on play. Uh, dude, I, I got to tell you a story. I love hockey. See, we didn't talk about hockey, but I love hockey. And I worked at an ice rink, and I drove the Zamboni for several years. Did you? And for, yeah, for one summer... Bruce McNow, at the height of the Wayne Gretzky era, the Luke Robitaille era, uh, Bruce brought the Kings to Palm Springs. They stayed for a month. And every night at midnight, they and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Red Wings came in. And they played Canadian no-check hockey every night for four hours. And then once a week, they'd play broom ball. And wow. I, got to play, I got to play on both the Red Wings and on the uh, Kings side. Wow. As a high school kid with some of the greats, some of wow. the true greats of the era. And uh, I started working for Dorothy Hamill. That's like, I mean, I had one summer, which was the Kings, the Red Wings, and Dorothy Hamill and the Ice Capades. I mean, dude, it was... <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, Gretzky was there, Robitaille was there, probably Yuri Curry, Kelly Rudy. Oh, all, all of them. Steve Eisenman and the Red Wings. And occasionally uh, 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 Elizabeth Manley would show up with fucking... Uh, 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 the dude from Growing Pains. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Kirk Cameron? Alan Thick. Oh, Alan Thick. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, Alan Thick was uh, him and Gretzky. I think are close. I do believe. Yeah, they were uh, friends. Yeah, that's crazy. So, who's your favorite NHL team? <sighs> that's a tough one, dude. You know, I, I I have to be honest. I know that I'm not trying to make anyone mad, but I happen to tend towards teams that are Quebec, or French Canadian. Okay. I, I I I like that playing style. Yeah. It's very aggressive, very fucking beaver trapper. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's very blackjack shellac, and I love it, dude. That's awesome. I'm, I mean, I'm a Vancouver Canuck fan, just close to Vancouver. I so. love the Canucks, dude. Yeah. I fuck, you know, I used to hitchhike. This is a fact. I used to hitchhike from Palm Springs. I used to take the Greyhound bus all the way up to Seattle. Then I'd hitchhike to the Swanson Ferry. I was going to ask you that. Sorry, Jesse, you mentioned that at the show in Victoria. Yeah, I, I did that. I mean, I spent so much time on Victoria Island and in West Van that, you know, like six years in a row. And it was the only place I ever hitchhiked because it, 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 the only place where a, a rich old man in a, in a white Cadillac would ever not try to get you to suck his dick when he picked you up. It's not like <laughs> it was a miracle. It was like the miracle mile for me. It was like I would get to the Swanson Ferry, no sweat. Dude, I will do this anytime you want. And I will, dude, I will go be your remote man on the scene. That'd be amazing. What I might ask of you, I don't know if you can maybe see if Josh is interested in doing something with us down the road. Of course, dude, I'll, I'll, I'll sandbag him and trick him and I'll just like suddenly <laughs> be there where he is. Bring him in with you. 
This is Boots Electric, and thank you for joining me on my special guest spot on Inside the Minds podcast, where everybody wants to be if they're smart. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. I really appreciate it, brother. Thank you, brother. Thanks a lot. Take care. We'll be in touch, eh? Yeah, please. I'm, I'm sure. And please tell, uh, please tell the other host that it was awesome to have met him. Gotcha. Yeah, I will. Um, wait, if you're ever up in Vancouver, Victoria, playing a show, maybe we can... Uh, do take a quick picture or whatever together done no you'll be a partying with me brother i hope so that'd be huge man it'd mean a lot to me oh it'll happen i'm a man of my work awesome thanks jesse i really appreciate it thank you brother